Well, good afternoon and welcome to our annual alumni lecture series. This year, however, it's a little bit different than usual. Uh, we're virtual, as is all of WEP, and it makes perfect sense and fits beautifully with the theme of connectivity. The annual alumni lecture series is one of the signature events of CAST and certainly our alumni affairs program. And we're delighted today to bring you five incredible alumni who are making an impact in their work all around the world and throughout Saudi Arabia. Uh, over the next couple of hours, you'll hear from five of our speakers, uh, the first three live and, uh, and the second two will be uh, bringing to you from uh, California. Uh, and that will be pre-recorded. So we hope that you interact as much as possible as you can with our speakers and enjoy the afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, we also have Professor Brian Moran, the Dean of Graduate Affairs, and something incredibly different, or at least I should say somebody incredibly different. We have Joe Watkins, who is uh, going to be sketching uh, the alumni lecture series. And so you'll hear from him halfway through this afternoon's lectures and he'll show you uh, what he's been able to muster up with, uh, with his sketches. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers, uh, Dr. Chao Shen, Maya Al Hashem, Sabrina Vittori, Rim Koja, and Angel Garcia Espalza. And first of all, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Chao Shen, who is live with us from Shanghai, China this afternoon to talk about Sanor Technologies, uh, which he is the founder of. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chao Shen. Thanks, Leah. Can I start? I'm sharing my screen. I hope everyone can see it. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Chao Shen uh, from Sendo Technologies. I'm uh, very glad today to uh, attend this uh, alumni uh, speaker session. And uh, uh, I would like to share some of my uh, stories and my experience in uh, cost during my both master and PhD degree, and also uh, my journey to transit from a, a PhD graduate to uh, involve myself into a startup companies. So what we do at Sanu is we try to bring internet, wireless internet to underwater and beyond, which help to connect underwater world. So to start, to start with, give a, I hope to give everyone a quick uh, background about myself. So I graduated in 2011 with a Bachelor of Science degree from Funan University in Shanghai. So at that time, uh, a course have a recruitment event at Shanghai, which I attended and I was deeply attracted by the wonderful hardware facilities and the unique experiences as well as the great faculty team at COST. And I make my, up my mind to join COST uh, as a master student. And very glad to receive my master degree in material science and engineering in 2013. And at that time, my supervisor, uh, Professor Bon Oe, uh, 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 attract me to continue become a PhD student in the same group working on a very, very exciting topic, which is a semiconductor lasers for high speed uh, uh, optical wireless communication. And during that PhD program, 
we found that the uh, device and the system we developed has a unique commercial value. And that is the moment we decided to, uh, to commercialize it. And uh, with the help of the uh, teams from IED, the Innovation and Economy Development, we start to create our own company called Sanu Technologies. The name is coming from Saudi Arabia Light. So no in Arabic means light. And I did a number of uh, uh, pages, try to grow our business all around the world, not only in the uh, kingdom, but also uh, across the world in Europe and America and Asia as well. So uh, I, I think some of you already uh, spent quite some time in cost, although it's a quite challenging time now, but I believe uh, cost you will enjoy a lot as a grad student. So uh, I still remember in 2011, there's no Chinese restaurant around, even not in Jeddah. And we spent uh, quite some time to cook uh, by ourselves, like those kind of dumplings, the baked dumplings. And uh, we also uh, cause have a great opportunity that led us to have fun. For example, uh, we organized the dragon show. I hope you can uh, play with it later after this pandemic. And uh, we also went to Jeddah to watch the uh, football games. And uh, we also going out, drive by ourselves to explore the um, unique uh, geographic and also the unique scenes are all across the kingdom. North part, South part, they have quite, quite different weather and different scenes. And uh, you, you don't want to miss. Uh, as a student, you definitely want to uh, study. Uh, work hard and study hard. And cost to offer a lot of lectures, seminars uh, from uh, well-known uh, scholars all across the world that not only in your own field, but also in other, uh, in other topics that you can, find, uh, you can find a lot of interesting works. And we also uh, work hard as an experimentalist. We, we spent quite some time in the lab, which I will discuss later. And uh, another unique point is also uh, we can form the SDGs, the self-designed uh, uh, groups and the students' uh, groups as well. I should say this is a very unique experience. For example, uh, we, we've co-founded the OSC, the Optical Society of American Student Chapter at COST which is the, the first student chapter in the GCC region. And we receive a lot of support from both the OSA uh, headquarters in the US and also cost graduate affairs. And we organize a number of different events from both the uh, technical, academic or non-technical part. We have those kind of uh, workshop series. We also uh, have these outreach events to visit cost school and uh, try to present the magic of optics and photonics to uh, primary school students, the uh, middle school students, and even high school students to attract uh, their attention to, to involve themselves in future careers in academic, especially in uh, science and engineering, uh, which I, I believe is a quite unique experience for graduate students. So talking about the research, uh, uh, it's really great uh, that uh, my supervisor, Professor uh, Bon Oi, as a uh, uh, lead and also is also the director of one of the five TICs, the Technology Innovation Centers in the Kingdom, uh, which is the TIC for solid state lighting. We also formed this uh, CAF called UCSP solid state lighting program in uh, late 2012 which uh, involve both academic institutions in kingdom, out of kingdom, and also the industry collaborators to, uh, to work on a very, very important topic, which is lighting. As we all know, lighting consumes a lot of energy, actually near one third of the energy is used for lighting. And the smart lighting itself can not only uh, use for illumination, but also integrate a lot of functionalities communication, sensing, uh, connect, uh, especially address those connectivity issues, right? So this is a theme of uh, this year's uh, uh, web that we can use light to enable really high speed data communication. Uh, for example, those uh, uh, the high bandwidth lectures that uh, we use today all supported by those fiber networks uh, across the continent. 
that will that is also thanks to the optics and photonics technologies. So research is not easy. Actually, it's it's, it's difficult, and uh, uh, actually uh, I spend a lot of time in the lab uh, to, uh, to build up all the setups we need for the experiments. And you need to think hard and think a uh, creative way to uh, make sure the things will work because most of the times things is not working well. And I still remember in early uh, 2011, because that is uh, only about three years um, when COTI started and the lab is almost uh, uh, is half empty. And I spent about one, two years to fill up the lab with different equipment, with different components, devices, and build up the uh, entire setup and build. And also, uh, although we have a very good co-lab facility, but we don't have a established process for my devices, for my experimental topic. And I also spent quite some time in the co-lab working with our went for collab team in the nanofab and in the imaging and the, the electron microscopy team. So although I start my uh, starting in 2011, about like four or five years, I don't have any results. Uh, I mean, I don't have any good papers published. That is until 2016, about five years. Then I start to produce good results and uh, have certain several number of publications and attract number of citations. So this is not easy, but you need to insist on a, a, a right path and work hard to pursue your goal. And I believe you will definitely reach the objectives with, because we do have a very, very strong support from the faculty, from the staff, and from the, uh, the wonderful scholars, students in cost. So cost is also the journey at cost also help me to make global impact. So we organize international conference at the cost. We also uh, form a strong alliance with uh, KFUPM, which is another great university in kingdom. And I was also invited to deliver talks in international conferences in Asia and Europe and the US as well. And we also uh, receive a different, uh, a lot of visiting students from uh, uh, all across the world. Like we have a great, uh, we make also great friends from UCSD team that they spend, uh, enjoy the life and work on a re collaborative research topic in cost. So it's cost, I, I should say that we are making continuous global impact. And I really appreciate the great people I met in cost. Uh, including our photonics team, and also we, uh, you know, spend time, enjoy life, to uh, have fun on the beach, to uh, uh, travel and work together. We have uh, our conferences in Riyadh, and uh, we organized uh, global events in cost to uh, receive international visitors, and. Now, after the PhD degree, I decided to work on the commercialization. It is a more challenging life compared to research. So once you start your company, you always have the dollar sign in your mind. The, the fundraising is very important for make your company alive. And you need to learn new skills, a lot of new skills. For example, try to present and pitch your idea on the stage, not only in front of uh, academic audience, but in front of a journal audience. For example, 100, 200 or live broadcasting, that is more than a thousand people. And you also need to prepare yourself ready to, uh, uh, to showcase your idea, showcase your product, showcase uh, your startup to uh, those VIP visitors. And more importantly, and more challenging thing is, you will also receive last minute calls and you will also receive a lot of situations that is unprepared. For example, uh, we, we uh, arrange our the, uh, uh, exhibition at Clio in Silicon Valley, but my flight is canceled and I'm, uh, I, was, like, uh, I was delayed in the uh, airport 
And after a, a, a lot of effort, I can I, I managed to uh, have arrived at the uh, uh, Silicon Valley just before the opening of the exhibition. And then I found that the check bag is delayed. And I have a lot of things in the back and cannot be used for the exhibition. So I need to uh, spend the last minutes to call my friends around to print out all the items and get the exhibition going. And also uh, uh, we attend another exhibition in Tokyo, Japan. And in the first day I found that 90% of them don't speak English. I have to find a translator in about two hours. And there's no power, no seat. And I need to address all the problems in about one or two, two hours. And that is the challenge part you need to take. So back to the theme, what we are doing at Sanu. So why we need to bring wireless internet to underwater? That is because there's a lot of demand for high-speed data link in sub in marine industry. And what we are developing is an optical wireless communication system. It's a 10K hardware that produces those high-speed network access, which is like 10,000 times, uh, 100,000 times faster than the acoustic system in underwater environment. So give you some idea. The, the conventional acoustic, which is sound wave, although it can trans transmit about a kilometer, but it's really, really low speed only a few kilobits per second, just like the speed you are sending the uh, short message. And it also have a light, high latency because sound is travel very slow. By the way, the uh, uh, marine mammals don't like the acoustic at all because it will interfere with their navigation system. That's why the silent ocean uh, campaign want to put those earphones to all the uh, dolphins. The RF technology that everyone is using today, like the 4G, the uh, uh, Bluetooth, and even the walkie-talkie that I will talk next week, has a really, really limited range because water absorbs all the radio waves. And this has created a technology space uh, vacuum that people cannot transmit high-speed data in underwater, where our laser-based optical wireless communication can transmit the signal at the, at the speed of light. It provides a high-speed, high-bandwidth and eco-friendly communication uh, technology to bridge this gap. Just give you some idea. If you want to transmit about one gigabit with the data, you need nine days if you're using acoustic. But if you're using our laser optical wireless communication system, you just need about nine to 10 seconds. You can transmit about one gigabit data. So uh, if talking about the market, remember, always re remember the dollar sign. The uh, interior optical wireless communication market worth is about 720 billion US dollars in 2023. And in three years, the visible light communication market will also reach about 600 uh, billion US dollars. And that is uh, why we decide to jump to in this market. It will be a rapid growing emerging market. Since we started this field, we are one of the earliest uh, uh, innovators and researchers developing those technology. And the uh, uh, high-speed optical data link will be about 100 times faster than 4G that you are using today. And our work has uh, attracted the attention by a lot of media, even Nature Photonics published a feature article discussed about our, our technology. We have five granted US and PCT patents, and another five pending ones. If you compare with LEDs, which a lot of you may already use it today in your home, the laser Li-Fi or laser OWC will be much, much higher data rate, a high speed than the uh, LED based technology. And we, are, uh, we have been selected by Nokia Bell Labs uh, as the global top five innovation in industry automation last year, uh, actually in 2019, and received a, num a number of other awards as well. So talking about the, the detailed applications, uh, there's like the pipelines and the environmental monitoring and the water, you definitely need to have a high-speed data link. 
and you have those kind of ROVs, the uh, remote control of those underwater devices, and you want to harvest the data from the underwater and the sub subsea sensors, you definitely need to want high data rate data links. And there's also fish farms, and you also want to position yourself when you are in underwater, and those will definitely all need those high speed data links that can be addressed by our laser optical wireless communication system. So here is uh, how will, does our hardware product looks like. So as the company, we design, produce, and manufacturing those underwater and the free space communication devices. And we also design those systems that can be customized with your own device, with your own, your own vehicles, for example. And we have those kind of duplex communication modem that can enable up to gigabit per second data rate communications between sensor nodes. And we also have uh, those uh, uh, devices that can be carried by your underwater vehicle, the ROVs, that will enable both the uh, energy transfer and the data communication. So in the future, we hope to build an underwater network that can enable different users to access the uh, wireless internet to achieve the, the uh, internet of underwater things. So if you look at the key specifications compared with the other available products on market, including the laser transmitter and the white laser uh, TX module, the transmitter module, we do have a quite huge improvement in terms of the modulation frequency and date rate which means we can transmit a lot of more data compared with other existing products. We also develop those high-speed receivers as well, because uh, if you want to communicate, you will definitely need to have both the transmitter and the receiver. So our transceiver, uh, our receiver will also be able to achieve much higher bandwidth, which means we can transmit uh, more data at a shorter time. So we de designed and developed those products in the lab, and we also test it. We have a number of field trials in seawater as well to test the, the, uh, the, function, the function of the system in really uh, in real working environments. So, you know, the marine environment is a very, very challenging environment. Uh, you have different turbidities, even at just a turbid environment, we still uh, manage to get our system working that will be able to transmit data in even a turbid uh, underwater environment. So uh, as the uh, co-founder of the company, uh, you also need to attend a lot of business events to present your product, to promote your, uh, your system and to develop the, your uh, business. Right, so uh, we we uh, we are very very delighted to receive the visit the visit of uh, the minister of Saudi Ministry of Communication and Information Technology, and uh, last year uh, late last year we also won the uh, silver prize in the IEEE Op Electronics Innovation uh, uh, Awards at OGC 2020. So all those achievements is not only made by, uh, by myself, but I really want to thank our wonderful team at Sunon Technologies, our CEO, Dr. Hala Arshim, our co-founder and uh, president, uh, Dr. Uh, Bon Oi, and our great uh, project manager, uh, Jie Hu. Uh, we, we also have a strong engineering team and our advisory boards and mentors, uh, including uh, Mr. Abdurrahman, uh, Dr. Sanki, Dr. George Studies and Dr. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Yuan Shi as well. So they provide a very, very strong support uh, to make all the uh, all the achievements. And finally, I also want to acknowledge the great people and the great team I met during uh, at cost. And uh, I want to thank the uh, the the funding support from CAX. Cost and CAX cost UCSB solid lighting program. And that without the funding from Cost Office of Sponsored Research, we cannot develop the technology. And I also want to thank our funding uh, for Sanu coming from Cost Innovation Fund, the great support from Cost 
Entrepreneurship Center, the Takadam program is a very unique program to develop the entrepreneurship skill sets and the entire course IED team to facilitate uh, uh, the progress that Les Sanu grew from uh, scratch to, uh, uh, to a company. And I would like to thank for everyone attending my talk today. And if you want to reach me, I leave my uh, email and my uh, WeChat and WhatsApp number on this screen. And uh, if I still have a few minutes, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Chow, thank you so much for that presentation. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, actually, two questions have been received, but within those two questions, there are about 15 questions in each. So um, I oh. think before I, <laughs> I know, I know it's great. I think, um, I think it, what I didn't mention in my introduction was that we're delighted today to have two entrepreneurs such as yourself, Chow uh, and Sabrina, two uh, founders of companies, companies that have gone from strength to strength to strength and that demonstrate to our students and to uh, the broader global community that KAUST has an incredible ecosystem and is supporting our students and alumni and many, many others uh, to um, develop their ideas and, uh, and their startups. And so um, the questions that have been received will border on you, Chow, but I think probably are also going to be relevant to Sabrina when we hear from her in a little while. But Chow, I'll start with one of the questions. At which point did you decide to shift your research work into a business and startup idea? How did this go with all your academic commitments and how can you achieve a balance between the two? Yeah, that, that's a great question actually. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's really not easy to make the, uh, the first step. Yeah, uh, I should I, I should uh, I should deliver my great appreciation to my supervisor and also our co-founder, Professor Bon Oi, who has a who is not only a very successful researcher and professor faculty member, but also a very great entrepreneur uh, who has already, who has founded three companies before in both Singapore and the Silicon Valley in the U.S. So I still remember the we have a we have a talk. Uh, uh, right before uh, I complete, uh, right before I start to work on my PhD thesis. Yeah, he asked me like, what do you want to do uh, after your PhD? Uh, I tell him that mm, this is a very good question. I always, I always want to, uh, you know, uh, try to experience the industry and try to work on something that will, you know, as an engineer, we all want to, uh, to do something that will be able to change the world, right? And uh, he told me, yeah, you already have the technology. Why don't you do it by, by yourself? <laughs> right. So at that time, I think about it as, I, as, mm, uh, as a young PhD graduate or close to graduate with a PhD degree. I think I can try it, right? And then I decided to move on to uh, work on the uh, startup project. Great. And you've been able to do it all, which is fantastic uh, with that layer of support. Um, the, the other questions I've got here are, are a little bit more intense. So I'm glad you're warmed up now. Uh, so to the alumni and in your case, Chow, uh, who are founders of company companies, what is the best moment to start up a new company? Uh, is it the time when you get the idea or is it the time when you have mature technology or is it the time you have the cash flow with your business model? So uh, actually, it, I should say those three points are all very great uh, points. And uh, as a technical guy, I should say that when I see the, the, the device working or when I see my product is working, that is the moment I enjoy it the most. But to be honest, 
as a successful businessman, you you always need to feel happy when you receive cash. <laughs> yes, that's right. And so you focused a little bit uh, on the dollar signs. So, uh, so it is a combination of all three. You think, but uh, but you think that the dollar sign is integral to starting a business. I mean, is that is that why you do it? Well. Uh, that is the uh, well. That is not my initial uh, point, but that is how the investors and uh, uh, the VCs look at it. So if you are not, you don't have a sense of dollar sign, or if if you are not eager to making money, they will not invest in you. <laughs> right, fair point. Okay. Well, we've got a. We've got about, uh, actually, no, I've got one more question that has just come in. Uh, and excuse me if that question is taking up the screen. But uh, the other question, Chow, is what is a good way to make good collaborations with people who are not in your field of knowledge and not in the same country? That is a great question. So actually, how to um, communicate and how to work together with uh, people in different fields or totally different background, not only academic background, but also the cultural background. That is, a, I should say, that's a huge topic. And I don't think I'm, uh, I'm uh, doing very good at that point as well. I still need to learn. Uh, but uh, I think the, uh, to try to, try to uh, talk, uh, try to listen more to, uh, to each other and try to talk, uh, that will be, uh, I think that's very important because if you don't start to talk and if you don't start to communicate, you will never know, you, you will never move forward. And uh, you should dare to start the conversation. Right. Well, Chow, that ends the questions and uh, and thank you for being our first presenter today. We always need uh, somebody to start off and you started off so beautifully despite our minor technical glitch. Uh, and, uh, and so I appreciate that you're in Shanghai at the moment, but I think to that earlier question you just had about working globally and across cultures, that's very much what our students and alumni at KAUST learn to do incredibly well, yeah. in addition to learning to work incredibly well across disciplines. And one of the thing that one of the things that our alumni often tell me that they most enjoy about their studies at KAUST is that opportunity to work in a cross-disciplinary sense because Absolutely. it really is beneficial once you all get out into your various professions. That's exactly so, true. Yeah, mm. that's, a, that's a very, very valuable environment bring, brought to me by cost. Wonderful. Well, Chow, thank you so very much uh, for being really. our first presenter today. Thank you too for providing your contact details should any of our students or other listeners uh, now or at some point in the future uh, want to get in touch with you. I know I uh, often seek you out to offer your wise words to commencing students, new students at KAUST and to the broader alumni community. You offer a lot of uh, great wisdom in a range of different areas. So thank you, Charles, so much for your time today. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. See you. And it's my pleasure now to introduce our second presenter today, Maya Da Al Hashem, who I will call Maya. As, as I speak with her because I met her several years ago when she was a student at KAUST. She's now an engineer uh, with Saudi Aramco in the, res the reservoir management department. And today Maya is talking with us about personal branding in the age of dis digitization. And, uh, and I know that Maya, or at least I hope that Maya will talk a little bit about what brings her to talk about this topic. Um, but I also hope you've got some stories in there, Maya, about, uh, about some of the other things uh, that enrich your life that you can share with, uh, with today's listeners. But without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Maya Al-Hashim.
Thank you very much, Leah, for your uh, introduction. I'll be sharing my slides as well. Uh, so here we go. Okay. Good afternoon, lo lovely ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, I can't uh, see you all, so I'll just have to trust that uh, everybody's listening, everybody's uh, viewing the slides uh, clearly. Uh, today, I'll be going uh, kind of away from the bread and butter of cows, away from science, technology, away from research. Uh, because it turns out that outside the ac academic bubble, logic, science, and reason are not the only driver to, in the professional world. So uh, just for you to gain perspective on where I'm coming from, I work in industry in a big corporation and uh, managing my way uh, within this kind of culture, I've learned a lot of lessons. So I don't know about you, uh, no, nor when your professional journey or experience in industry is going to start. But uh, the lessons that I've learned the hard way after I left my comfort zone, which was Kaos, um, I, I thought that it would be very valuable for me to share so that you can uh, jump over these kind of obstacles. And uh, if you have ever uh, decided to uh, join industry or uh, go out of the field of science, uh, I mean, uh, the field of research, uh, you're prepared to uh, learn all these soft skills. So especially at this time, we're very, very challenged to be at a time where competition is, is higher than it has ever been. And uh, technology has advanced so far, everything has gone digital, even uh, some of uh, our, our social interaction with uh, other people. So it is up to us right now to differentiate ourselves from the crowd, because guess what? When I thought, I used to think that the opportunity that uh, I, I'm going to get is indeed working for the company I was going for. It turns out that without branding myself, I would be missing out an opportunity within this opportunity. Just a little about myself again. Uh, my name is Maya Del Hashem. I go by Maya. I work at Saudi Aramco in the upstream as a reservoir engineer. I graduated in my undergrad from uh, UC Santa Barbara in chemical engineering and pursued mechanical engineering at uh, KAUST for my, uh, for my uh, master's degree. And uh, I, I was uh, even part of the KAUST gifted students program and they offered me the scholarship to study in the US prior to uh, joining KAUST. So at the end of the, my master's degree, I started to grow an interest in, uh, in AI and machine learning as I was uh, starting to work in uh, Professor Mani Sarathi's uh, laboratory. And uh, I loved how he had uh, a lot of uh, futuristic ideas in the CCRC. And uh, I started to read more about machine learning. I started taking classes in computer science, uh, but then I got the opportunity to work in uh, Saudi Aramco in 2017. So since this was a new interest of mine, I decided to continue diving into my interest. And uh, while I was working in Aramco, I completed uh, Audacity six month nano degree program in machine learning. It was uh, very challenging, especially that I had to learn a Python programming prior to joining this program. And throughout the journey, alhamdulillah, including my undergrad, my grad, even uh, the beginning of my experience in Aramco, I managed to publish several patents and publications in multiple disciplines, whether uh, my academic background or my uh, experience in, uh, in oil and gas. So I want to talk about personal branding. What is it anyway and why is it so important in the workplace? 
one of the best definitions that clearly explains the concept of personal branding is that it's establishing and promoting what you stand for, what defines you. I mean, your standards, your values, your work, your ideas, your thoughts. Your personal brand is the unique combination of skills and experiences that make you you. And why does that matter? Is that effective personal branding will differentiate you from other professionals in your field. And the reason why I chose this topic to begin with is that I experienced firsthand how uh, this uh, skill in particular differentiated me from uh, other people to uh, gain uh, different opportunities. So now, why is it important to brand yourself in the workplace? You might ask yourself, isn't it already enough that you've already uh, worked so hard and polished your CV? You've gone through interviews to get this job. Why do I still have to promote myself by personal branding? Well, we already know that the environment, even within the workplace and the work culture is pretty competitive. So branding yourself can help you stand out from the crowd. It also attracts opportunities. And uh, I want to drift away to uh, a personal anecdote from my own experience, although uh, as uh, you've already seen that all my formal education has been in engineering, chemical, mechanical, and now I'm working in petroleum. My job title is a petroleum engineer. It's all about engineering, but for the past three years I've been in Aramco, I have been branding myself as a multidisciplinary engineer with some background in uh, Python programming and machine learning. The latter two were areas that I chose to develop by self-learning, and I work to emphasize my brand and deliver presentations in the workplace in these areas specifically. And alhamdulillah, today I'm being utilized in my department to use programming and data science to optimize our engineering work as my main function. Alhamdulillah, it was all due to Allah's uh, blessings, then to my personal brand, or else I would have only uh, utilized as an engineer. Another uh, reason why we should focus on personal branding is that it directs your career and the way that you want it to go. So when you start creating and going for the opportunities that uh, you find yourself fit and competent for, uh, you are uh, in reality directing where to go. And this is uh, also something that I've seen in my personal experience. Another thing is that personal branding builds trust by you upholding a certain standard or quality of work. For example, if you're known to de always deliver work on time or have the best slide designs or write flawless reports, your reputation is what you, uh, you're good at will soon spread around, uh, around your coworkers and they'll start trusting you in the places where you've, uh, you've been known uh, to perform excellently. It will also increase your self-awareness. So when you try out new things and hone your skills, uh, your new skills, you're always going to be improving your brand and improving uh, your own uh, knowledge about yourself when you see uh, what gets to you and what doesn't. And lastly, uh, it's uh, personal branding also expands your horizons. It helps you explore new places. So unlike academia, you don't need to stick to your own field of expertise. Although maybe uh, the chaos environment is not 100% uh, uh, within uh, this kind of persona, uh, what's uh, great about uh, chaos is that the research centers uh, kind of uh, help you go into uh, different uh, fields of sciences and combining uh, knowledge uh, rather than uh, focusing on uh, one field of uh, application. But uh, in, uh, like, but also in uh, your uh, field of uh, expertise or the professional world, 
uh, you also don't have to stick to uh, your own area. So you can volunteer to handle uh, interesting projects and tasks. Uh, you can uh, expand uh, the, 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 the areas that you choose to involve yourself in. And once you start building experience in that area, you will see yourself opening up the next door and the next door and, and the next door. And all it takes is uh, being open from the, the first step. So now that we must keep in mind that we're living in the digital age and this, especially during the pandemic times, many of our interactions have turned virtual as you can see, and this is why the web even uh, uh, adapted and turned virtually. Uh, it means that we, uh, it makes it more challenging to maintain our brand, but it's not impossible. So what do you actually do in order to build and maintain your brand? I like to focus on objectives. So now that we talked about all the outcomes that you can gain, from uh, building uh, your personal brand, uh, I would like to uh, go for each one of the personal branding possible outcomes and use a technique to target these results specifically. So for the first point, if you want to stand out, the best thing to do is to actually show yourself, speak up during meetings, be vocal about what you can offer, uh, even in virtual meetings, being proactive goes a long way. Also, another thing, which is uh, kind of a new concept, is to know your audiences. It's important to adapt your technique if you're speaking to your coworkers, management, or even branding yourself in virtual platforms. So, for example, the way I brand myself in LinkedIn is completely different from the way I brand myself in Instagram or Facebook. I acknowledge that my audiences are different uh, in, each, uh, in each platform, and I'm aware of my branding objectives uh, in each one of these areas. So opportunities may come when you least expect them. So the advice is to be open and ready also to be flexible and adaptive. Sometimes these opportunities will help you discover areas that you enjoy and you excel in, which brings me to the next point. If you can uh, use these opportunities uh, to direct your career, it would help uh, greatly to know what you want. Delving too deeply into something that seems useful but does, uh, does not take you closer to your goal is actually a waste of time. Even if it's reading books, it might expand your horizons, but up to a certain level, if you do, uh, do it too much, then you're actually uh, not utilizing your time effectively. The next point is building trust. So if you, uh, so, uh, if you want to build your trust, you definitely need to be consistent. Trust requires reliability. What would also help uh, in building self-awareness is to be mindful of yourself while going through the different stages in your career. What do you enjoy? What kind of task do you, uh, tasks do you find boring? Where do you, do you find yourself competent and skilled? What fields do you find more interesting? So uh, this all takes an open mind while you're going through these experiences. And last but not least, to expand your horizons, it is definitely advisable to stay updated and relevant. See what are the latest topics and try to stay two steps ahead. And while you're at it, work on expanding your network too. It always helps your personal brand to have a network of people who know you and know your, un your unique points and would even talk about them to others. Now, there are certain techniques and resources that you can capitalize on to emphasize your brand and also help you learn and explore more opportunities in the workplace 
I call those the professional boosters and power-ups. So the first one is mentoring. And there are different concepts that are uh, easily confused with each other. So I'm going to uh, elaborate on them as uh, I have uh, joined different programs within the company that helped me identify the differences. And the way we identify uh, these concepts helps us uh, capitalize on each one of them rather than depending on one. So mentoring is the relationship that you form when you as a mentee approach a mentor through a formal program or a personal contact, asking for a mentor's guidance, encouragement, and support because uh, they usually have more experience than you than uh, in uh, what you want to be mentored in. The aim of mentoring is to facilitate the mentee's learning and development and unlock your potential. The role of the mentor is to be a source of wisdom, teaching, and support. Often someone uh, outside uh, your company or immediate environment, so you don't have a conflict of interest. So the traditional mentoring relationship tends to involve uh, individuals with three years of experience in their field who can guide you with uh, or someone with less experience to help you shape your future career goal and success. Uh, they can offer insights into the world of work and help to develop business confidence. Mentoring can be uh, either an informal relationship established between the mentor and mentee, or it can be a part of uh, a structured organizational or educational program. And this is uh, something that I experienced myself. I joined a mentorship program, uh, which uh, helped me a lot to gain all the benefits of uh, mentorship. So for uh, as a story, uh, there's uh, someone called Tang who currently mentors a Mexican student uh, looking to find a graduate's role in, a, in the UK says, Throughout the process, I've tried to pass on ideas rather than outright solutions. I want Alan to adapt uh, and flex his approach as he develops rather than copying what I did. As the mentee gains insights and experience, mentors can take pride in their success and development when they see other people avoiding their own mistakes. The, the second booster, is sponsorship. A sponsor is a network and action-oriented uh, mentor, uh, action-oriented mentor, taking mentorship to the next level, while mentoring is generally related to providing advice and guidance around key development areas. A sponsor is personally involved in the mentee's next career step. In the big business context, sponsors are well-respected individuals who use their large network to help with hiring and career decisions. Uh, choosing to sponsor someone means becoming their advocate, both in public and behind closed doors. And this is why we emphasize the role of uh, networking, because you want to have more sponsors in your life, people who are talking behind your back about uh, your capabilities, your, your talents, uh, how, what functions you can support in. So a sponsorship could be anything from champion an individual for promotion, promotion or getting them uh, on the books for conference presentations. If sponsoring an individual, uh, if uh, someone is sponsoring an individual, they have to make sure that the person they choose to sponsor are actually uh, competent and they have high levels of professionalism and integrity. So if you demonstrate it to someone who could be a potential sponsor, then they will most probably start talking about you. The next relationship and professional booster is coaching. Coaches are different. So they're usually approach, uh, approached by coaches for help with one specific or one or more, but a set uh, of specific tasks or problem. Uh, the, the, coach, uh, the coaching process is a very uh, performance pr uh, driven process focused on uh, getting predefined results. 
The professional relationship often has specific goals to meet, such as a skill that you want to learn or a problem that you need to overcome, which is when uh, the professional uh, relationship ceases after you're done with coping. The last, uh, the last point is uh, something that a uh, concept that uh, I kind of uh, came up with to optimize or boost my experience, especially in the beginning of uh, me joining uh, industry. Capitalize on licenses. So to help you understand what it means, uh, I remember taking a class about culture when I was an, an international student in the US. The professor explained uh, the term foreigner's license. And what he meant was the fact that when you are a foreigner in a country and you violated a certain culture norm, the locals around you in that country will probably excuse you because you're a foreigner, uh, you haven't been brought up this, uh, the same way, you don't speak the same language. So they kind of excuse you until uh, you are accustomed to their culture. So what I would recommend is when you first enter an environment or uh, like uh, you, you joined a company, is to be very well aware of this concept and try to be aware of your licenses that you have in your workplace and capitalize on them because they kind of give you an excuse to expand your learning opportunities. For example, I used to allow myself to make mistakes and to try out new things to speak my mind freely when I entered Aramco because I wanted to utilize something I called not the foreigner's license, but the newbie license. The newbie license is where I know that everybody's going to uh, excuse me for not abiding by the company culture, the, the, like the details of this culture and the details of their politics because I'm new. In conclusion, personal branding is a tool that we can use to enhance our experience in the professional world. We all see, seek uh, career success, but in the end, we all have one of two choices. Either we make excuses or we make progress. So what will it be? Thank you everyone for attending this brief talk on br personal branding. If you have any questions, comments, or would like to network with the KAUS alumni, please find my email and social media account on the screen and do not hesitate to reach out. Maya, thank you so much for your session. I was busy taking some notes uh, back here and, uh, and I think you've had um, an incredible career so far. And I really enjoyed listening to how you've been able to, not in a sense, diversify professionally, but enhance uh, the skills uh, and uh, the academics um, that you have as an engineer to build on to your career. Because from memory, you've also become a coach, haven't you, a, a, a coach in the, the business sense? Yeah, I, uh, I also developed myself as a life coach. Right now, the sky's the limit. We can find any kind of courses we want and certification to take online. So uh, that's why I keep telling people we can always have excuses, but what do we want to do with our life? Do we want to accomplish something? Well, well I, I think you're extraordinary and so Thank do you. our student participants and there are some questions that I have for you that, uh, that I'll make a start on. Uh, one of those questions is, if you work on science which defines how the world works, what is your feeling about uh, ML, um, which is totally, uh, oh, well, ML. So machine I'm sorry. Learning. I, yeah, machine learning. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. Which is totally uh, 
and and her totally heuristic right now is is the word that's used but nevertheless I'll say that again because I messed up if you work on science which defines how the world works what is your feeling about machine learning uh, actually, this is uh, a question that I keep uh, getting a lot when uh, I do my machine learning technical talks because uh, machine learning is going by data rather than uh, physics. And uh, we, you can't really ex explain the trends and results that you get the same way we can when we are dealing with physical rules. And uh, this is why uh, my personal uh, opinion and the, the message that I kept uh, sticking to uh, within, because like I work in an engineering company and then getting petroleum out of the ground is a, com a very engineering intensive process. Uh, but at the same time, there is an opportunity to capitalize on to use AI and predictive models. Uh, so the message was uh, to uh, kind of equip engineers with the machine learning capabilities so that they're able to uh, either explain the trends that uh, they come up with in the models or uh, decide where does uh, machine learning come into function without uh, completely disregarding the science. In the end, we don't want to start from zero. So I hope I, uh, I know that this is a huge discussion discussion and you can uh, contact me on my email or any of my uh, contact information uh, if you want to continue that conversation. Fantastic. Thanks for your response to that question. I've got uh, another one. Uh, how did you develop your skills on Python as a self-learner? I, I actually took uh, courses on uh, no, it wasn't course. I used all kind of, uh, <laughs> of websites. So I, I uh, kind of uh, started with the EDX to learn the fundamentals. And then uh, in my opinion, uh, or uh, from my experience that uh, programming is a skill. It's not something that you learn and then do a couple of uh, assignments and then you're a programmer, you need practice. So for that, there's an excellent website uh, called hackerrank.com. Uh, they have uh, certain, and it's free, they have uh, certain programs like uh, 30 Days of Code where they send you daily challenges. They give you something, some kind of objective and you have to hack it or uh, code the solution. And I loved it because it's uh, very functional uh, and like they're function oriented rather than uh, the theoretical kind of uh, lecture kind of uh, approach. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that. And one final question, Maya. Uh, do um, people in Aramco on the engineering side use Garobi Solver for math optimization tasks? If so, can you highlight those tasks? Uh, actually, I'm not the best person to answer this question. I'm not familiar with uh, that program. Maybe it's uh, in another uh, department or a business line. Good. All right. Well, Maya, thank you. Um, thanks to for making yourself available uh, to talk with any of uh, our students and fellow alumni and other participants who are listening today. Uh, I know you spoke in your session just now about the importance of mentoring or identifying a sponsor uh, as you grow and, uh, and build your career. So um, you've always been very open to speaking with our students and other alumni uh, as a mentor or advisor uh, or in a number of different ways. So thank you for providing your details. We'll make sure they're there. and. Immense thanks, Maya, for your time today. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Me too. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. It's my great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sabrina Vittori, who graduated from KAUST in 2017 with her PhD. Uh, many of our students might be familiar with Sabrina's uh, 
face and uh, and her work as the CEO of Adama Organic Solution. She's talking with us live from Italy today about the circular economy of waste, food and water, and being part of the solution with Adama. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Sabrina Vittori, thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Nia, for the introduction. Um, yeah, today I will talk about the circular economy of food waste and, uh, and water and how I actively took a role in promoting it and uh, uh, founded the company Edam Organic Solutions. A little bit of background so um, you, you get to know me a bit more. Uh, I'm a statistician. Um, so uh, I actually received my bachelor and my master uh, from Italy and then I moved to Kaos for my PhD. I really enjoy doing statistics, uh, doing programming and modeling and uh, um, I know for some people it can be a bit more, um, a bit look like a bit scary, but I believe it's, it's just a different language to learn as, as we learn English or Spanish, we also learn programming and uh, um, statistics and probability and uh, really it becomes much easier once you get to know the patterns uh, and uh, understand a bit the mechanisms behind. Um, so I, as I was saying, I received my degree in Kaos and I had a wonderful experience in my PhD at Kaos where I met a lot of wonderful uh, and very clever people, both in terms of fellow students and professors that really shaped my career afterwards. Um, and uh, I made this, uh, this choice of switching from academia to the industry. And uh, that was because I, at some point I realized that um, I really wanted to make uh, a big impact. And I realized that um, the word, the industry world needs more scientists to fill the gap between the knowledge we have in academia and what is actually applied. And I, I thought that my, um, my background and my personal inclination and aspirations will make me succeed more into this, uh, into this uh, um, environment. Um, being an entrepreneur prepared me, prepared me uh, massively for, uh, sorry, being a, a PhD student prepared me massively for being an entrepreneur. Um, in fact, the skills I learned during my PhD uh, were very much translatable into my, um, into my entrepreneur role. And uh, in particular, getting a PhD is very hard as, as we all know. And uh, similarly with funding a startup, so there are um, many obstacles that, that we need to be able to overcome and uh, never give up. Uh, at EDAM, I lead on business strategy, business relations and uh, uh, business development. Um, and uh, I've, been, I've been able to, to achieve lots of results during these uh, three years. And I'll take you through um, in, the next, uh, in the next few slides. Um, I will take you through my story, my experience um, and I would like to start especially with what motivated me. Uh, and uh, to do that, I will explain to everybody what, uh, what is a food system and how it works, what is a sustainable food system and what are the challenges that are involved with uh, the system that we have today and how Edama comes in in order to address some of these challenges. So the food system is very complex. It includes many players that perform interlinked activities at different stages of the supply chain. Uh, we have production, aggregation, processing, distribution, um, and all of these um, activities also involved subsystems like the farming system, the waste management systems, the input supply chain system, and they all interact with other systems. So you understand that a structural change in this complex system, um, it needs to be always thoughtful and always uh, interconnected with uh, the changes in other systems. Um, I would like to really highlight the importance of having young and well-prepared scientists 
uh, and entrepreneurs that propose business models that can help making structural changes in our food systems in order to move from what we have now to a more sustainable, uh, more sustainable environment. The food system today, as we know it today, has um, several challenges. Um, uh, we talk about water scarcity, less than 1% of the total water in the planet is, is fresh and easily accessible. Um, but even, even this is rapidly depleting because of intensive agricultural practices. Um, um, our soil quality is, is, um, is generally um, decreasing and that's because of soil erosion or for the use of chemicals and intensive agriculture and other reasons. Um, um, we have issues with food security, thinking about the planet um, increasing population. Uh, it is expected in many areas of the world um, to have a, uh, to double the um, food demand. Um, uh, there are many health concerns. Sadly, there are um, more people in the planet that uh, live in countries where obesity is, um, is a bigger killer than undernourishment. And uh, on top of this, we have climate change issues. So uh, we know that the, the food system is at the moment not efficient and it's actually responsible for 20 to 30% of the greenhouse emissions on the planet. Um, another big issue that we have is food loss and food waste. About 30% of the food we produce is actually wasted. Um, so if food waste was a country, it will basically uh, be the third country producing, um, producing food. A sustainable food system lies at the heart of the United States Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, adopted in 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals called for major transformation in agriculture and food system in order to end hunger, achieve food security, improve nutrition by 2030. Uh, to realize the Sustainable Development Goals, the global food system needs to be reshaped and needs to be more productive more inclusive of poor and marginalized population, environmentally sustainable and resilient, and able to deliver healthy and nutritious diets to all. There are complex and systematic challenges that require combination of interconnected actions on the local, national, regional, and global levels. Edama is the leading company developing organic waste recycling solutions that are specifically designed for desert climate conditions. We started our journey at KAUST and that was in 2017. At the time I was just finishing my PhD and uh, uh, I started this company to address three major challenges, which are waste disposal. In fact, most of the waste that we have in Saudi is currently going to landfills where it threatens the environment and public health. In fact, uh, most of the waste we produce is organic. About 60%, 65% of the waste in landfills is organic, and it is responsible for about 90% of the CO2 emissions. The second challenge that we tackle is desert agriculture. Because of the low fertility and water holding capacity of sandy soils, desert agriculture is extremely inefficient. Saudi produces only 25% of its food, despite using about 80% of its water resources for agriculture. Soil improver products for farming, landscaping, and land development are currently imported from abroad, which makes them costly and also polluting. Uh, you have to think that to improve one hectare of sandy soil, we require about 100 tons of soil improvers. And this is to implement the certification practices as well. At Edama, we believe that the sustainable development of our cities can be achieved by an efficient use of our resources. So our mission is to create a local circular economy that recycles organic waste into soil improver products that can be used by landscapers and farmers to grow more food using less water and closing the loop on this vital living system. 
Our mission is aligned with social, environmental and fiscal targets set by the 2030 vision and the national plans. We worked on recycling technologies that integrate the most advanced and available worldwide um, composting methods with local needs and scientific know-how. So we work with a range of international partners, which gives us access to a portfolio of world-class technologies that we further adapt and develop in our labs. Our soil improver products are designed by our plant scientists to uh, increase the efficiency of desert agriculture. That means uh, increase uh, the fertility of local sandy soils and uh, decrease uh, and, and increase the water holding capacity as well, decreasing the water demands. Uh, we work with local agricultural landscaping companies and government entities to ensure that our products comply with standards and certifications while also keeping a competitive market price. The common denominator in all our projects is our circular economy approach. And this brings a lot of social, environmental and economic benefits to Saudi cities and to the MENA region and beyond. So by diverting waste from landfills, we dramatically reduce pollution. And by supplying high quality soil improvers to landscapers and farmers, we enable them to switch to more efficient water cultivation systems and increase local yields therefore leading to increased local food security by supplying um, by supplying uh, by supplying our soil improver products um, also to landscapers we help them realize in projects such as the green riyadh project um, at lower cost and higher quality than what they would be able to otherwise but just by importing the products from abroad uh, we also help protecting public health thanks to the reduced pollution, reduced use of pesticides, and all of this translates into a better quality of life for both citizens and visitors. And all of these benefits, in fact, introduce cost savings for our food system and for our uh, public health. And those cost savings are worth 9.5 billion SAR every year on a national scale. Moreover, building recycling infrastructure will lead to economic growth and create many new jobs opportunities for both men and women. And we estimated a value creation of 42 billion SAR by 2035 on a national scale again. So at Adama, we, we built the local experience, the technical competence and the scientific resources to provide bespoke waste management solutions fitting different project needs and different social economic context. Uh, we handle projects from ideation to execution, so we have capabilities to do feasibility studies um, and we also take care of engineering, uh, procurement and construction management, uh, operation and maintenance to the highest international standards uh, and product quality assessment and distribution. At KAUST, we have been operating a pilot facility, uh, recycling waste from the local supermarket, the diner and the landscaping activities. Um, and uh, uh, we are now in, now in the process of scaling up our operations uh, and uh, building a large scale composting facility that will be serving the whole cows community, recycling all the organic waste available on campus uh, from the different activities. Uh, we had an overwhelming demand of soil improver products that we are gonna be able to fulfill thanks to this facility. Uh, I would like to um, say a few words on the technicalities of the facility because I think it's important to highlight how we manage with our scientific backgrounds to actually bring composting to the kingdom in a way that was adapted to the conditions that we have here. Um, so we basically have a facility that takes into account the ultra high temperatures that we have and is able to regulate um, temperature by a special aeration system that was purposely engineered for it. Uh, we also innovated in methods for processing uh, challenging but abundant local feedstocks such as palm fronds, um, uh, which are currently just sent to landfills and don't have any use. 
Um, because we really care about the sustainability of our facilities, uh, we use fully electric equipment, so we sold, when possible, solar powered and zero waste water discharge uh, in order to optimize sustainability. Um, of course, we have odor control methods for biofilters, and we also use sensor monitoring um, systems uh, and control systems uh, that incorporate AI in order to optimize the composting process and minimize the cycle times. Um, our facilities have a modular design, so they are also scalable. Um, um, this is the project that we have at KAUST, but at the moment we are also talking to different government entities and mega projects in order to expand and further develop our facilities in additional, um, in additional location. Uh, we are a young group of professionals. We all met at KAUST. Um, beside myself, uh, I met Mitchell Morton at KAUST, our CTO. And he was um, he has a PhD in desert agriculture from cows, so he leads on product de product development and brings in a lot of the knowledge that we have in order to improve the efficiency of desert agriculture. So that Hagbani is an industrial um, engineer, and he was um, he he did his master at cows and. Uh, now takes care of business relations and uh, helps with um, um, it, it helps the fact that he has a very um, a very developed regional network spanning spanning from the industries to the agricultural sector. And Rowan Jandu is our um, CCO and he has a strong background in business and finance. Um, uh, what we all have in common is a strong passion for sustainability. And since the beginning, we, um, we felt very strongly committed to four values. Um, so sustainability, ensuring that our business had a very positive and strong impact into our society, uh, improving food security, water uh, security, and also reducing pollution. Um, innovation, we want to bring science out of the labs and make sure that we can solve real world problems with clever solutions. Resourcefulness, because um, we pioneer um, creative approaches to problem solving. And community, communities are at the center of our business. We need everyone to do their part in order to achieve our results. And I'll explain a bit more later what, what you can do in this regard. Um, a little bit about our story. We started in 2017. And uh, at first we had our composting in our backyards and we started to gather a bit of, um, you know, advice and a bit of momentum. Um, and uh, uh, that's basically like we started without, I heard the question before, we started without any money or, uh, um, or not, not that much in terms of uh, uh, technical uh, um, experience in composting itself, but we were very motivated to the cause. And in 2018, we participated in the um, Takadam Accelerator Program and we won. So we had our first funding that allow us to expand and to expand the team and to expand our operations. And then in 2020, we achieved, um, we, we achieved the innovation fund. So we had more funding in order to further expand so it's a very iterative process, the process of being an entrepreneur. You always have to um, have a little prototype first and then keep, keep working on the better version. <coughs> Sorry. So what can you, what can you do? Uh, well, you can for sure help us. Um... <coughs> Sorry. You can for sure help us doing your part if you live at cows and separate your organics properly. Um, we would really appreciate the support of the students in this initiative. We know that the students are particularly careful and particularly aware of the issues that we have. And it's important for us that you take a strong stand on this. <coughs> Sorry again. 
Um, I would like to conclude my talk with uh, just giving a couple of advice for the students that are that are here today. In particular, I would like to say that uh, um, first of all, not worry. Like you're gonna get through your PhD and you're gonna good enough to get your degree. And remember to enjoy life in between as well. And uh, uh, another piece of advice that I feel like giving is that. Uh, um, anyone can choose their career according to what they think it's, uh, it's best and the way they think they can perform the best. Academia or industry are both very valid paths and the world needs committed scientists and well-prepared young people that are committed to change. Um, so don't be afraid of that. Thank you so much again. Sabrina, thank you so much, uh, particularly for concluding with uh, that advice for our students who are listening, but thank you so much for leading us through a conversation uh, about uh, Adama and, uh, and the work that you are doing. Uh, we have had one question so far, actually we've had a couple of questions, but one question um, is a very interesting one from one of our participants. It is, uh, who are your, or who were your primary competitors in the industry or market when you started the company? So that is a very interesting question. Actually, when we started the company, we didn't have competitors in the kingdom, at least. Um, that is because we started in a very undeveloped waste management market. And uh, at the beginning, we had a hard time convincing anybody really that this was a good idea. Um, so at the beginning, we didn't really have many competitors. So still now we don't have many competitors. We mainly have companies that are already composting abroad that are thinking of coming into the kingdom. So has that been an advantage or a disadvantage, uh, yeah. uh, not having the competitors? So in a way it's an advantage because we had the first mover advantage, which is a very, very, um, a very big advantage, normally one of the best advantages you can have in business. When you are the first at understanding a new trend, that's where you can get in and really be the first to accomplish yourself and establish yourself as market leader. Um, so that that's definitely one of our biggest advantages. But at the same time, we had a lot of skepticism coming from, um, you know, various, various um, even uh, people that, you know, investors, uh, some investors, some, um, some mentors, uh, there was, it was definitely a challenge to convince everybody of the, of the validity of our business being the first. Did you and uh, your colleagues who make up Adama set out to uh, come to Calst? Uh, did you set out to do your PhD here and at the same time start a company up or did that just happen along the way? Uh, no, it very much happened along the way. I mean, when I was doing my PhD, I was very involved in sustainability initiatives. I was uh, in the Graduate Student Council and I was um, committee chair and then I founded the Green Group. So I was, I was very much involved with sustainability initiatives and uh, very active. So that's what made me then um, face the issue of the waste and and when I understood that there was no no way of like in solving it um, I've decided to start a business and do it myself so that that was kind of uh, the starting point uh, that's why I think it's really good for students to be involved also in different extracurricular activities because you can learn so much and you can really change your life mm, fantastic I have received another question that is just a little bit more practical, if you will, rather than necessarily scientific. Uh, and that question is about how we go about separating our organics here at KAUST. Okay, so here at KAUST, um, uh, you can separate your organics um, um, well, I have to say that right now organics are not recycled yet, but our facility is going to become operational about June this year. So in June, you will be able to actually send your organics to our facilities and they will be recycled. We accept everything 
um, including like food, uh, like kitchen scraps, um, uh, so potato peels, uh, all, of, all, all of what you use basically for like preparation in your kitchen, also leftovers, um, um, not leftovers that are very greasy. So if you eat a lot of Burger King, you might not want to throw it all in your organic bin. Um, and then paper and wood and any garden material. So we will be conducting a campaign in cows to explain well how to separate the organics from the rest. And uh, um, yeah, my contacts are up on the slides. And if you like to participate, I will, I will ask the students, like, please let me know because we'll be uh, making some advertising material to help people separating waste. Fantastic. Well, Sabrina, thank you so much for your time today, but uh, more importantly, thank you so much for all you're doing in the area of sustainability. And I think we in Alumni Affairs have uh, had the privilege, uh, certainly I've had the privilege over the last four and a half years since I've been here to talk with a lot of alumni who uh, set out to change the world, to make an impact. And, uh, and I talk often about the entrepreneurial ecosystem that CalST is privileged enough to have that is enabling so many of our students and alumni to actually truly make an impact in a number of different areas. And I think uh, you've just demonstrated the way in which you're doing that. And, uh, and we thank you very, very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we've uh, got time for a little bit of uh, something quite different. We're about to meet uh, or at least see some of the work of our sketch artist, Joe Watkins, who is uh, connected to us from Ohio uh, in the United States. And uh, Joe is from an organization called The Sketch Effect. And, uh, and he's been connected to us, listening into our, our conversations, watching us, uh, and, uh, and is going to be representing uh, the conversation through sketch. So uh, Joe, we'd love to see where you've got to so far. Fantastic. Fantastic, that's great. Um, almost a, a mind map of, uh, of what we've been talking about. Let's just all take a minute to have a look at this. Terrific. Well, Joe, thanks so much for sharing that with us. And I understand you'll be joining us a little bit later to show us how you've progressed. Thank you so much for that. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Reem Koja, who is one of our founding class alumni and, uh, and for those uh, participants who are among our student community now, we have a group of alumni who we refer to fondly as our founding class. They came to CalST in 2009. And in fact, both presenters, uh, both two final presenters this afternoon, Reem and Angel, uh, are among our founding class. And so they'll be talking not only about their work in the area of connectivity, but they'll be talking a little bit about uh, their time at KAUST and what they've been doing since. Uh, in the case of Reem, after she graduated with her master's, uh, she went to the United States where she eventually completed her PhD at, the UC, at UCLA. She is now undertaking her postdoctoral fellowship at UC uh, Irvine and she'll be speaking with us today on, uh, on her work in micro submarines. Now I do have to point out to our participants that uh, Reem was pre-recorded. She is, as I just said, in California and, uh, and there is an 11 hour time difference. So 
Uh, we look forward to bringing you Reem's very interesting presentation right now. So hello everyone. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation. I have to say that um, I'm a little bit jealous of uh, Web 2020 speakers as I wish I had a chance to visit and uh, the campus and revisit so many beautiful memories in Kaos. So a little bit about myself. My name is Reem Koja. I live in Jeddah, not far away from Tuwal. I joined Kaos to do my master's degree and it was an incredible experience for me and all founding class 2009 as we were part of the beginning of uh, Kaos story. So after that, I joined the bioengineering department in UCLA in Los Angeles to complete my PhD in the DiCarlo lab. I was really motivated to build devices that advances medical diagnosis and therapeutics. And at that time, something happened that really inspired me. I happened to watch the sci-fi movie Fantastic Voyage for the first time and that film changed the course of my academic research. So the film was made in the 60s and it's about a submarine crew who are miniaturized to a microscopic size on par with the size of a single human cell. And so they venture through the human body to repair a damage in a specific organ in the body. And I was incredibly fascinated by this concept of miniaturizing devices and how it cannot only revolutionize therapeutic drug targeting uh, and delivery, but also enable building so many wearable and implantable health monitoring devices. So I started to look into these technologies uh, that enables miniaturization of devices at a microscopic scale. And so moving forward 60 years later from the release of this uh, movie in the 60s to 2021, many technologies uh, has been developed enabling building such tiny structures. For example, in 3D printing, uh, multi-photon lithography enabled building uh, microscopic complex structures uh, like this micro spaceship here you see from uh, Professor Daniela Craft Lab. Bell Labs and many others developed single molecule electronics that enabled uh, building nanoscale circuits replacing silicon-based electronics so let's say to switch on and off the submarine. And I joined many other researchers in an NSF funded center called TAMS in the pursuit of building micro motors on par with the size of a single human cell. To walk you through this process, let's first imagine a simple motor and then try to miniaturize its parts. So the most conventional motors are operated by an electromagnet simply rely on Oersted current uh, through a, a coiled wire uh, approach, creating a uniform magnetic field. Switch the current direction and you will switch the magnetic field orientation, causing the propeller to rotate and so on. However, this concept of creating a magnetic field with a current through a wire does not scale with the size of a single cell. The micromagnetic properties at that size scale is large enough to ignore the atomic structure of the material. However, it is small enough to resolve magnetic structures such as the main walls and vortices. So if you look closer to your fridge magnet at the micro scale, it is composed of multi uh, magnetic uh, domains and collective spin and their collective spin orbits of these multi domains uh, form the north and south pole. However, if you miniaturize uh, magnetic materials at the micro scale, they don't necessarily maintain their polarity and will turn into multi domain states with weak stray fields. So, and that is due to the uh, energy competition between the exchange energy and the demagnetization energy. So we need magnetic materials to form strong magnetic fields with constant uniform magnetic properties at the micro scale, because we won't be able to switch the direction of the magnetic field uh, if the magnet does not act as a single domain where all the magnetic moments are pointing at the same direction. 
Uh, also, we need programmable magnetic properties at the macro scale. So I would be able to predictably and repetitively control the direction of the magnetic field. And that this made us think about new magnetic materials called multiferroics that have one constant magnetic properties at the macro scale, also programmable magnetic properties at the macro scale. So uh, with these new uh, multiferroic materials, um, they can change their magnetic properties by electric polarization, also by uh, magnetization, and also by deformation or stress. And we also refer to them as magnetoelastic materials. So when you exert a strain on these macromagnets, it will change their magnetization direction and then go back to its original state. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, is the same concept, this concept of switching magnetic field I mentioned and the electromagnetic motors. So now uh, we can use these multiferroic micromagnets to build uh, micromotors with the size of a single human cell and operate uh, in a viscous medium. And lastly, we can also program their magnetic field. And that was my goal throughout my PhD research. And hopefully this would be the building blocks that get us closer to a big vision of installing a micromagnetic uh, motors in micro submarines. So let's start with more with the technical stuff. So we fabricated a novel multiferroid material called Turfinol D. Uh, Turfinol D is an intermetallic composite uh, of terbium, dysprosium, and iron. And uh, that has the highest uh, magnetostrictive strain of any known soft magnetoelastic material. So if you can jump in here in the hysteresis uh, uh, loop, uh, you can see that they have both hard and soft magnetic properties. So when you uh, magnetize them uh, with an initiation field, they, um, uh, and then you switch off the uh, uh, external field here in the, in the x-axis to zero, they still have strong remnant uh, field in these micromagnets. And um, uh, so we fabricated uh, a three micron uh, disks uh, of, of the surfinol D uh, magnets and uh, we, we found that uh, we were really happy about this MFM image we, we find here that shows um, a single domain-like structure at three micron uh, a meter in diameter. So you can see the stray field going in and out in a uniform manner. And also these micromagnets were able to capture uh, magnetic beads in their poles uh, without an external magnetic field all operated by these magnetized uh, terminal D disks. And so we fabricated larger terminal D disks with 20 micrometer in diameter, uh, similar sizes as a single cell. And for the first time, we were able to see an effective single domain in such large structures. And this is really exciting because as we discussed earlier, it's important to have uniform field uh, to be able to program its magnetization direction. And Terfinol D have been shown as the highest magneto uh, structure material with, uh, as we see here, the largest uh, single domain at 20 micrometer in, 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 uh, in diameter. Uh, as, and as you can see here, the, these black patterns of Terfinol D disks interacts with these green fluorescently labeled nanomagnetic particles from large distance in fluid. And um, also you would see in the uh, uh, video on the right is that uh, these uh, terminal D micro disks extracting a micromagnetic bead and localizing uh, on one of its pool, specifically on, its, uh, on, uh, on the magnetization pool. So the next step was we wanted to integrate a microfluidic channel on the surfinal D micro pattern and found that even in flow, they were able to capture or attract these magnetic beads. And that is important because we want these micro magnets to operate in fluid. 
And uh, these terminal D microstructures, we build them that with different uh, structures that range between three to 20 micrometer in, in, in size, exhibit precise magnetic capture based on highly localized fields in the magnetically initialized single domain folds, regardless of their shape and isotropy. And um, as you can see here, the, you can see the Brownian motion on these uh, um, uh, micro magnetic particles localized on the folds of these different uh, uh, different old DD, uh, uh, disks. And so we ran image analysis software to get heat maps of these captured bead location across the micro pattern. So you would see here these um, red uh, fluorescent labeled uh, nanomagnetic particles um, uh, highly localized on the poles of these differently um, uh, uh, fabricated um, terminal D shapes. And, um, and uh, we found that iron gallium with the same size of terminal D does not uniformly capture beads on the, its uh, magnetization poles while terminal D structures less than 40 micrometer in diameter remain single domain uh, with uniform bead capture on their effective uh, single uh, uh, domain magnetic poles. And so we were able for the first time to get measurable magnetic properties of terminal D uh, uh, microstructures in viscous medium because MFM and XMCV PIM cannot measure uh, the magnetic properties in different uh, fluid conditions. So one way to, to, for us to approach this is that we were able to approximate the magnetic force of the magnetized terminal D stray field by calculating the force balance between the magnetic capture force on the magnetic bead and the hydrodynamic drag force on the bead uh, from the channel flow. And from the image analysis, we got a, as you can see here, a 2D map of the uh, magnetic binding force of terminal D disks in viscous medium. Now for the last part, we wanted to program or switch the magnetization direction uh, by exerting strain on, on terminal D micro disks uh, via PIM and PT substrates. And uh, uh, by it just so if we go back to the animation here, when we exert strain, then we can change the magnetization direction. And so uh, for single domain structures, uh, the bead moved toward a new magnetization angle after adding strain on these micromagnets, while multi domain states, the beads were rearranged differently. So we can see an effect of strain on these, um, uh, on changing their magnetization uh, direction. So in this video, we demonstrate a magnetic uh, bead moving towards a new magnetization angle due to the new minimum in the energy landscape created by coupling the strain in these uh, multiferroid magnets. And also we can see an example here uh, as well. And if we go back to the animation earlier, this can serve as evidence that multiferroid micromagnets can indeed have potential to exert motion on micro propellers. So, um, so using the study, we also found that these micro motors can serve in other biomedical applications like in so sorting single cells. And so we're able to capture and release single cells via these micro motors. Um, so, um, and we found that there was a problem in, in the field in, in, um, in magnetic cell capture is that you capture the cells in bulk via a large uh, magnet, while with these micromotors, you can get a programmable array that capture and release specific cells based on their uh, biophysical properties or uh, based on their phenotype. So, uh, and this uh, paper is, is in review in advanced material currently. And also uh, in other papers, uh, we used um, uh, perpendicular magnetic anisotropy uh, with a co uh, cobalt nickel multilayer to attract beads specifically on the perimeter of these micromagnets. Uh, we use also, in another paper, uh, we were able to scale down these to a nanoscale, uh, moving one micron 
uh, magnetic field uh, 45 degree away uh, from its original magnetization axis using uh, nickel rings. And all these technologies can serve to get us closer to in building micromotors for micro submarines with programmable and uh, um, uh, 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 navigation, let's say, uh, through a human body. And so with that, I would like to thank my advisors who supported this long-term vision uh, and my research collaborators uh, working closely together that grew into friendship. And I want to thank uh, funding resources of NSF and TAMS funding. So uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Reem, so much for your presentation. And we're sorry too that Reem couldn't be here in person uh, to talk with you all today, but we look forward uh, to involving her in a future alumni affairs or CAST activity. In fact, it might be worth highlighting now that uh, last year I was just looking at some photos of our 2020 alumni lecture series because it's always such a highlight in the year and uh, was reminded that one of our speakers in the 2020 alumni lecture series, which we did in person a year ago, included Reem Koja's husband, who is one of our alumni, Faisal Nawab, who has gone on to work in the United States uh, as an assistant professor. He has recently moved to the University of California, Davis, where he works in the electrical engineering, the computer engineering space and, uh, and is one of our uh, alumni in the academic uh, higher education field in the US. In fact, we were delighted to see both Faisal and Reem uh, a year ago in Palo Alto when KAUST hosted an alumni event. Uh, but for today, we're virtual and, uh, and in many respects, we're enjoying very much the opportunity to be able to speak to a much larger audience through our connectivity via Zoom and other virtual platforms. So uh, we now uh, will be joined uh, also pre-recorded by alumnus Angel Garcia Esparza. Angel, uh, as I said earlier, came to CAUST as one of our founding class and graduated with both his master's and his PhD. He completed his PhD in 2016 and went on to undertake postgraduate study uh, in Lyon in, in France. And then over the last two years, he has been working at Stanford University. Uh, at Stanford, he is a research associate in SSRL, the synchrotron radiation light source. And today he'll be speaking about his research uh, and his topic is study of two-dimensional autonom autonomically thin MOS2 monolayers via operando spectroscopy. Uh, as you can see, I did not do so well in pronouncing that, but we're about to go into Angel's presentation where he will do a stellar job of talking you through not only that title, but the research that he's currently undertaking at Stanford University. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk. My name is Angel. I'm from Mexico, and I'm delighted to be here joining the web activity activities. And I'm very happy and very thankful to be invited to this session. And I, I'm really excited to share with you guys what I have been doing since I left Gauss. I will share my screen quickly with you guys. So currently I'm working at Stanford, specifically at Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, which is part of the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. So, but I started in Gauss and I was part of the founding class uh, and I did 
first my master's degree in environmental science and my PhD degree later in chemical science under the supervision, both under the supervision of Professor Kazuhiro Takanabe, who is currently uh, back in University of Tokyo. So I was in Kaos as a London class from 2009 and graduated or got my degree at 2016. And then I was doing here experimental work at Kaos and I moved to France to be a theoretician. So I work as a postdoc in Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon, sorry, pardon my French, in the theoretical chemistry laboratory. And I was a postdoc here for two years from 2016 to 2018 until I got a call from Stanford and I got a position as a postdoctoral scholar as well working from 2018, 2019. And I was later promote, promoted in at Slack to be a research associate uh, I, at, uh, this year, actually there, there's, uh, there's a mistake here. So I have been working here at, at Stanford for two years and uh, I'm mostly based at the synchrotron. So this is what Slack looks. This is the National Accelerator Laboratory in the US, and it's the it will be the brightest uh, producing the brightest X-rays in the world uh, this year. So this is a linear accelerator, and we also have in this facility a synchrotron. So it's a, a, a another accelerator here. So you see the size of the building here, and this is the ring where the electrons are accelerator. And this is where we fit the electrons to the ring. And this is where all experiments have happen. So that's why the the logo of of our department is, is like this, because we have a ring of electrons and we take X-rays out of this accelerator. So that's what we produce at Slack, basically very bright and large, large amounts of X-rays. This is how the synchrotron looks. Uh, I'm talking about synchrotron because my talk is based on the type of spectroscopy work that I do here. And we use synchrotron radiation as an energy source for the spectroscopy. And this is how the experimental uh, holes look. So basically around the ring, basically we, we have different uh, experimental base, base stations. They, call, they are called beam lines because there's a beam and basically there's a line and you sit here and you're experimenting inside a hutch and you, you do your experiment there. So why a synchrotron? Because it produces very bright photons and very bright light in a high flux of light, like lots of photons. And we can tune a very broad range of energies. So different wavelengths and uh, we can use those different energies to do the spectroscopy that we want. We can measure and we can look at and we can study many different kinds of materials, uh, included COVID-19. And it's a very collimated and polarized, extremely collimated light search. So it's very well defined. Um, this is how it looks where I sit in the computer and the hutch here inside is well protected for the very the high energy x-rays that we use in in my experiments inside of this hutch this is how it looks it's basically a lot of tubing and a lot of pipes and a lot of cables uh but the x-rays comes from the right hand side and they travel through here and then they hit the, they hit the sample inside this box and you can measure what comes out as well from these boxes right here there are more complicated setups with a lot of uh spectrometers and uh, a lot of crystals and different type of detectors uh, basically, uh, uh, we, we have one of the most advanced uh, beam lines in the world uh, that we can do very advanced spectroscopies with this X-ray. How the experiment looks, basically, you trace coming from the right, like we saw. You, you measure how much X-ray you, you get from that side, and then you put them into your sample, and you see how they interact with your sample, and then you can check how many X-rays come out of the sample or you can check also the fluorescence of the sample if, if the sample is absorbing the energy and many other different type of events, the physical events that we can 
do with the X-rays. We can do scattering, we can do diffraction of the light, we can do fluorescence, absorption, emission. We can do different physical processes based on this synchrotron radiation. For example, here in this beam line, we have X-rays that we can use from two kilo electron volts, so 2,000 electron volts, to 11,000 electron volts. So we can actually cover pretty much a whole periodic table uh, to do experiments. Uh, basically, it is just based on the photoelect uh, photoelectric effect uh, that we all know. Uh, Albert Einstein got a Nobel Prize for this effect. Basically, you hit the X-ray, you hit your sample with the X-ray, you kick out or you excite uh, an electron from the core level and you measure what it comes out. It can be a fluorescence or it can be an Auger effect. Uh, so it's a X-ray absorption event. And based on the relaxation of the levels, you can measure different uh, characteristics and basically is element specific, right? Depending on these energy levels. So it's very useful for identifying basically almost all atoms, uh, and particularly in the vein lines that we develop. Uh, the sample, what kind of samples can we measure in this uh, synchrotron, right? What can we do with this synchrotron? Basically, any kind of sample, you can have a jet of li a liquid jet, you can have a suspension, you can have fine powders, you can have rocks, you can have tissues of brain, brain tissue, you can have lunar rocks, you can have a fossil, a prehistoric fossil. You can have uh, viruses. And you need to learn how to prepare the sample. So the sample needs to be homogeneous. Uh, but the, the good thing is, depending on the en energy, you can use x-rays uh, almost in any environment. And therefore, therefore, it's very useful because you can measure the sample in, in their actual state, actually, in the proper state. Uh, or in, in its environment, let's call it like that for now. Um, there is different way, there's different limitations, of course, how much sample you need, like few milligrams, or you need to create a specific th thickness, maybe some some micron thickness. So you need to learn how to how to properly design your experiment. But basically, practically we can measure almost any kind of sample in our synchrotron. And, and there's some examples here. We can do combinatorial chemistry. We can do high temperature catalysis. We have different, we design and, and, and we, cre we build different setups to do, uh, for example, uh, we have cryostat to do low temperature. We do this high temperature furnace to do reactions at, at uh, high pressure, high temperature, 1,000 degrees. Uh, we have uh, set up for radioactive samples, biological samples, biohazard samples automation with robots so we can do many things. Uh, so for example, if you take some of the materials that you can find in your lab, like molybdenum sulfide or some oxides like molyoxide three and molyoxide two, you can take the powders, you make a nice pellet and you can go to your beam line and you measure the spectra. And this is how it looks. You change the energy of the incoming X-ray and then you measure the signal coming out. So this is the spectra, right? And this is called a white line. So these peaks is what we measure. And as you see, depend, depending on what is the environment of the molybdenum or the sulfur around, uh, what atoms are around, what is the geometry of the atom, what is the oxidation state of the atom, this X-ray absorption technique, uh, which is called SANES, is very sensitive to all that. And you can see the difference. The shift in the energy indicates the oxidation state and the different structural features correlate to the electronic structure or the empty density of states of the core levels. Um, so I have said that we can measure almost any sample in this condition, but what about very thin materials? Then you get to a problem of statistics, right? You need enough sample to count the photons that you're getting out. So. How, what do we, what do we do about this? Because we want to move forward into connectivity, right? So everybody, it, it's into these bending phones and uh, what will be the next generation electronic devices. So to to go beyond the Moore's law, we really need to go to the atomic scale, right? So one way to do that is uh, 
to use this, what is called two-dimensional material. So the most famous one is graphene, but the one that I will be focus on, focusing on today will be molybdenum sulfide. And this is a single monolayer. So here I'm showing two layers and a single monolayer of this material is a semiconductor material that can be used to make transistors. And they, this material actually has a very high electron mobility, very nice properties for microelectronics. And it has been said that has an instability of up to 350 degrees. But the working temperature of actual transistors that have been built with this material is actually 150 to 250 degrees. It's actually pretty hot. It has some hot spots, but in theory it should be stable enough. But it has been some studies that show that the materials are actually not as stable as we thought they would be. So we go ahead in our lab in, at Stanford and we synthesize this material by chemical vapor deposition and we create a monolayer. So a single layer of this uh, semiconductor on a silica wafer. And we see they have, we have a very homogeneous sample, very single crystalline molybdenum sulfide. Uh, this is Raman spectra showing that it's a single layer and the TM is showing that it's, it's very well crystalline, crystallized. So we made two different samples. We, we observed that uh, the, the pristine made sample it contains some nanoparticles in them. And you can see this in the uh, micrographs here in the microscopy, we can see them here. And we can treat them at different oxygen temperatures and we can see that these nanoparticles actually increase in them. But we can etch these nanoparticles by using uh, an alkaline treatment and we can create this clean or oxide free, what you will see why I call it oxide free um, material because now we know that these nanoparticles are actually some form of molybdenum oxide that it's remaining from the synthesis procedure, but we can remove it. So we have two different types of samples now. So we are, go ahead in the place where I work and we develop a new instrument. So we can actually measure this atomically thin material. So it's just a single layer. It's less than one nanometer, right? It's like six angstrom. And we designed this this instrument so we can go and ahead and measure this material actually under different reactive atmospheres. So here's the, here, here I'm showing you the first try that we measure the, the sulfur KH uh, transition or the X-ray absorption spectroscopy of a single monolayer of molyb molybdenum sulfide in helium at room temperature. And this is what we call just terminology, this we call the pre-H because we have an edge absorption edge here. So this is the white line. And then we have a post edge and the post edge has a name which is called EXA, but it is not important, very important what it means, but it's defined structure. What is surrounding the absorbing atom, which in, in this case is the sulfur K, the sulfur atom in the molybdenum sulfide. But the, the, the also surprising thing here is that we actually design in this instrument so we can put different gases and we can see how these material reacts with the gases. So we can input hydrogen at high temperature. This is 500, 550 degrees C. And we can see that first we lose material because this is the absorption is proportional to the amount of atoms that are in the sample, right? So the amount of sulfurs are decreasing, meaning that we're removing sulfur from the sample. So we're, we're thinking that we're creating vacancies. So in the semiconductor, the vacancies are creating. Which vacancies? We're creating sulfur sulfur defects. So we're creating a sulfur vacancy here is going away. Here, I'm introducing 3% oxygen. So this is in basically uh, in an oxidative environment and I'm increasing the temperature of the reactor. So from room temperature up to 400 degrees. And here I'm measuring the molybdenum atom now instead of the sulfur atom. And you can see as the temperature increases, the spectroscopy or the spectra, the signal is changing. So the material is changing. The molybdenum environment is changing. And it has different behaviors from the pristine sample as we made it, or the edge sample when we remove these nanoparticles that we saw. So what does that mean, right? So you see here that the particle starts changing at around 100 to 200 degrees, right? And here the, the, the sample didn't change at all until about 350 degrees. So we, we can quantify this, we can fit the spectra and mathematically fit the spectra using some standards. 
and we can quantify the amount of molybdenum sulfide and the oxides present in the sample. And we can see that the as grown sample or the, made, the as made sample, the pristine sample, contains oxide from the beginning. And as we heat from 100 degrees, the amount of oxides increase, increase, and keep increasing. So it means that the molybdenum sulfide is oxidizing further to molybdenum oxide and molybdenum in state four and in state six. Whereas when you remove the nanoparticles from the beginning, you can heat the sample up to 300 degrees and then you start oxidizing. This is, this is very important because if you want to make a transistor and the transistor is working at 200 degrees, you want your sample to remain as molybdenum sulfide up to 200 degrees. Whereas here we know that the sample is already changing, so your device will be breaking down. So we, are, we will report, we are reporting the first observation that the actual, the, actually the oxidation process start at temperatures as low as 100 degrees C. So quickly, I just want to thank, of course, my supervisor for the PhD at CAOS, who is now at the uh, University of Tokyo, Professor Takanabe, my supervisor at, uh, Fran in France, in the UNS, and my current supervisor right now, Dr. Socaras, which is uh, a senior scientist at SLAC, and Dr. Nordlund as well, and our collaborator, Professor Shaoli Cheng at Stanford in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and my close colleague uh, who made all the work with me, uh, Dr. Sangwook Park. Uh, and we have close collaboration with Professor Philippe Sote in UCLA and Professor Domen and Kubota who were before at University of Tokyo. And thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to answer any of your questions. Well, we thank Angel for his session this afternoon and his overview of the incredibly exciting research that he is undertaking at Stanford University. And I think for those students who have uh, listened this afternoon, you'll have had a really good sense of the career outcomes of the CAUST alumni community, uh, which is now uh, 2,138 uh, alumni of the university who are working in a range of different areas and also have gone on to undertake postdoctoral studies at some of the world's best universities as we have just seen uh, with Angel's presentation. Now, both Angel and Reem, as I said earlier, were pre-recorded because they're in California, but uh, I'm very happy for anyone who has any specific questions of either of those presenters to let us in alumni affairs know and we'll make sure that we facilitate an introduction for you to Reem or Angel. Right now, I would like to invite Joe, uh, our artist from the Sketch Effect back to uh, show us where he's got to with his sketches uh, before we wrap up with our closing remarks. Joe, thank you. Cool. Great. Fantastic. Joe, thank you so much for that. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Brian Moran, who is Dean of Graduate Affairs, to offer his closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Lee, and thank you all for participating in today's uh, alumni lecture series. Once again, it has turned out to be a fascinating afternoon, and I hope you enjoyed it every bit as much uh, as I did. I'm not going to go and summarize uh, the talks, but I found them all fascinating for many, many different reasons. Maybe most of all, uh, just seeing the wonderful accomplishments of, of our graduates, what they've gone on to do seeing some familiar uh, faces live today and others recorded and, and touching base again with some of our founding students. It's been a, a wonderful afternoon. And uh, you know, once again, the alumni lecture series at WEF is one of the hottest tickets in town, I think. 
So it's been, it's been a great afternoon and, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So our thanks to, uh, to Chow, Maya, Sabrina, Reem and Angel for, for their wonderful presentation. Uh, thanks also to a number of other people who made today happen. Uh, Lee and Hugh in, in uh, Alumni Affairs, uh, of course, but also Khaled Salam and Mary Lauer and the whole WEF team uh, and Flavius and his team who, who, who worked behind the scenes for us here, here this afternoon. And thanks also to uh, Joe Watkins for those uh, fascinating looking uh, diagrams, which I think we, we all look forward to studying in a little bit more depth uh, and seeing some of the, the, the nuance and reminding us of, of, of the fantastic afternoon that we have. And, I'm sure we can find some way of, of, of making sure that everybody who participated here today gets a copy of those uh, sketches. So once again, thank you everyone for uh, your participation. Thanks again to our speakers. If, uh, if it was possible, we would give them a uh, rousing round of applause, but well done everyone and thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to our fantastic alumni speakers this afternoon. As I mentioned in my introduction, this is an event that we put on every year. Uh, it's our signature event, and we love bringing our alumni back to talk to our students and our CAST community. And, uh, and we in Alumni Affairs uh, look forward to meeting our students virtually or in person uh, through a number of other activities that we will have throughout 2021. Our next one is in March. It's an alumni career panel, which we will be offering virtually as well. But we hope you've enjoyed today's session. Uh, it will be available on demand on our alumni website and also of course on our web website uh, at some point in the future. And we would be delighted to introduce you to today's presenters or any other alumni with whom you would like to get in touch and talk to about your careers or your research. Uh, we are uh, a fantastic, close-knit, uh, global cast alumni community and, uh, and we in Alumni Affairs would be very happy to um, support your studies and your future career plans by introducing you to alumni. So thank you so much for your participation today and enjoy the rest of WEP. Thank you and goodbye.